hey everyone this is uh, avinesh tripathi i am a cube simplify ambassador and for today i'll be managing this twitter space and uh, if i'm i'm sure most of the folks would be aware of what cube simplify is but if you're not so cube simplify is a community um founded by sam partak and what we do is we are on a mission to simplify cloud native for everyone and we do a lot of things in order to you know uh, complete those mission so uh, you can find us doing some great blogs so uh, cube simplify ambassadors are there they write some good blogs um we have recently started with the devops series where we where uh, cube simplify ambassador themselves are coming up and they're making videos on uh, devops the series is going on we also do some good crazy workshop where uh, some ex- experienced folks come along and they they uh, on a live stream they teach us about the uh, devops tools and various concepts and we do a hands on workshop over there we also run mini projects which is uh, some you know uh, a great place where ambassadors come and they contribute to project they build along and not only ambassador we have a lot of folks who join so a uh, website is something that we have built for kip simplify and that was a part of the mini project one of the mini projects we are moving ahead with some new ideas making a golang cli or something uh, apart from that we do this kind of twitter spaces where we talk a, a lot of things we share experiences and you, you folks learn about a lot of concepts from from experience folks and uh, if we, if you don't want to miss these things I, i'm you should you know join our discord channel you should uh, give a follow you should subscribe to sayam's channel and yeah that's pretty much it so let's not waste a more time on this uh kunal why don't you just bring the things on yeah sure thank you so much avinesh for introducing cube simplify and just summing things up a bit we are a community we are a diverse community even if you are a practitioner who has been you know involved in the cloud native ecosystem for a while now or even if you are a beginner who just wants to get started we have space for everyone here so yeah if you want to just contribute join our discord channel and we'll have a conversation there awesome and again i want to remind everyone that this is a community platform and a community space so respecting everyone is what we fall what we have always followed i would recommend everyone to respect each other while asking questions and we'll definitely try to answer as many questions as possible all right now uh, you know today we the topic is computer networking and we have an amazing panel over over here of amazing speakers from all over the student community so let's start with quick round of introductions of everyone mystica would like to go first on this one okay i see uh, mystica's uh, account is showing connecting so maybe she shall rejoin marino let's start with you then how about you give yourself a quick intro yeah sure thank you kunal um i just want to point out that chris noon is also in the audience there so if you want to invite him up to speak that'd be great um i hi everyone my name is marino wijay i run around the community and and advocate for network engineers to move over to the devops space Um I'm also a developer advocate at a particular service mesh company called solo.io. Um I am a father and a husband. I have a son that's like one and a half running around doing his thing. Um and I live in Canada, uh up in Toronto. So happy to be here. Happy to, you know, share some knowledge about networking, but you know what? The real experts are here. Chris and Mystica, they've got all the real knowledge. I've just like I just come along for the ride. So happy to be here. Awesome thank you so much for the intro Marino and I just want to give you a shout out for the amazing work that you have been doing in the community and recently I saw that you have been organizing daily twitter spaces on these th- those are called devrel coffee chats so I would recommend everyone to check those out and you know if you want to know more about devrel and yeah do give De- Marino a follow while you are at there Alrighty I see Chris has also joined that space so Chris would like to give yourself a quick intro Yeah, thanks. Sorry for 
for being late and struggling to get on there. Uh, so my name's Chris Noon. Um, I was traditionally a network engineer working with hardware products like Cisco and Juniper, things like that, FortiGate. Moved into the SDN space and then finally into the cloud space, kind of focusing and specializing on that network piece. And most recently, I've joined a company called M0 who focus on kind of infrastructure of code and automation. But obviously, my love for networking doesn't go. So a lot of my demos and stuff are around the network automation piece, which I think is, is going to be big. And yeah, looking to get more involved in the Kubernetes networking space as well. And it's great to join spaces like this to, to help people get there. Awesome. Thank you for sharing, Chris. And I see that Mystica is having again a, a little bit trouble with the Twitter thing on our network. Let's see if she can join in and introduce herself quickly. Let me just try to invite her. Okay, I believe uh, she would be rejoining in a bit. I believe till then, let me introduce the topic for today. We'll let, you know, Mystica introduce herself when she rejoins. So today we are, you know, discussing about computer networking. And this is, as a big, from a beginner's perspective, I believe uh, this is a really important topic, important section. If we talk about a DevOps roadmap, and you know, we'll be we'll try to cover the most important concepts and topics that fall under computer networking. And I believe you'll definitely get a nice overview of the concepts that are involved and absolutely the resources to get started with. So this is a brief about what we'll be talking about in today's space. I see Mystica. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah. So yeah, I'm, awesome. Please, yeah. No worries. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. So I'm Mystica, and I'm working as a remote software developer for a company that is based on Florida. That is a startup. And I'm working from my home in India. India. So I'm working for, I'm working as a software developer for like one year now. And recently got into computer networking and, and love to share what I learned so far. Thank you for having me here. Awesome, man. We are, we are glad to have you here as well. And just before jumping onto the questions, I'll say to the audience that uh, do give all the amazing speakers that we have here a follow. See the amazing work that you're doing in the community, and that would very well help you in your journey. And I really hope that the Twitter gods stay with us today. Awesome. Let's move on to the questions now, you know, uh, related to computer networking. So... The very first question that may come to someone's mind when they hear about computer networking would be, what exactly is a computer network, right? As basic as it can get. So let's start with this one. Uh, who would like to go first? Uh, Mystica, Marino would like to go first. Let's start with Marino. <laughs> Why me? <laughs> you know, I, I came along to the conversation because I thought we were going to talk about how we were going to set up our computers in a little LAN party style setup, but I'll be real. Okay, computer networking. Your computer, right, This the system that you use to play games, browse the web, you know, chat with your folks, send emails, develop code, that has to connect to a network somewhere. But you, you actually don't even truly know where, you know, that network is, what it is, but you plug into something or you connect wirelessly. But at the other end of that, that wireless connection or wired connection, there is something there that is intelligent enough to basically direct whatever you're doing out to this public world where all of these other computers are connected. Um, but all of these other computers have information that you might need, well, well, that your computer might need. But at the end of the day, what actually goes on is when you make a request or when you are doing something on your computer, your computer is making requests on behalf of you that are translating these requests into 
you know, these network things, these network packets or communication, but it has to tell something upstream, you know, what it's looking for. It has to communicate with an upstream box to say, hey, I am trying to get here or I'm trying to get this kind of information. Can you find out how to get it for me and then present it to me so that I can present it back to this this user who is sitting behind this computer is effectively what computer networking is. Now, it's not as just simple as that because computer networking or networking in general has a lot of like complexity behind that because you have all of these different computers connecting to each other there you know there's this massive network out there how do all these computers know about each other how do we really get to that that piece of information that we're looking for how do we get to that s3 bucket where we're trying to pull down data and a lot of this has to do with how we build networks. Uh, I'll stop there because I know Chris and Mystica definitely have some some insights to add on to that and share alongside that. Uh, but we'll definitely get pretty deep here. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Marino. Uh, who would like to go next? I don't want to pinpoint anyone. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, Chris? I'm I'm happy to go. Um, I think it's one of the, the harder questions to, to answer. I mean, whenever I meet family and friends and you tell them you're a network engineer or a network architect, you can't really explain it unless you're in the field. Uh, so it's, it's one of those difficult questions. But yeah, I, I agree with, with, with Marino and everything he says. You, you, can, you can spitball a number of things that, that computer networking is, but essentially it's just the connectivity from one IT device to another whether we're talking about laptops in an office, um, iPads in a home, whether we're talking about serverless architecture in AWS, while all of them use compute and all of them kind of generate, let's say, pages and requests and all that kind of thing, the, the communication behind all of these devices, that's what a computer network is. And it could essentially be as small as, as the Marino says, a small LAN party when you're, when you're gaming together with your friends, it can be as large as an ISP or multiple ISPs. It's all about that connectivity from one device to the other. I think iPad to Google, computer networking got you there from one end to the other. So yeah, the computer networking for me is that if you send, if you want to send your text message or images to your friend who's on like another side of the world, all we use is something called a network. That just uh, it is a, like uh, it's like it it connects it, it connects the two devices in order to make a communication. So that is what computer network is for me. Thank you so much for answering everyone. And uh, like from a beginner point of view, I feel that a computer network is like a web, right? Every system is connected to one another. And we can call that particular structure as a web. So I believe in a very, very much layman language, we could call it as a web of, you know, systems connected together. So we discussed about, you know, what exactly is a computer network, but how do these various systems, you know, communicate together? If we are talking about in a network, how does one know, okay, where is another located and how does this file transfer happen between these? So if we could just touch upon the basis of this particular topic. Next. Yeah, I mean, I, I can go first. It, it comes down to essentially the basics of networking. So, I mean, I have a lot of conversations with people on that the new into the field, they want to do cloud networking. And I always say it's, it's probably good to at least, you know, you don't have to go and do a pass a CCNA, for example, but it's good to skim the material. It's understanding, you know, what a MAC address is, what a VLAN is, um, what a subnet is and what an IP address is and, and what routing is in general. Kind of those five core topics will allow you to understand how communication is made. So, for example, in a home, we're typically all on one VLAN, we're all on one flat network. You know, most of the time it's a 192.168.1 address. And then essentially we're all on that flat VLAN. And if my iPad wants to talk to my TV to push something to stream, for example, it essentially says, oh, I'm looking for this IP address. So I'm looking for this IP address. What MAC address is that? And then it's going to work at a, a layer two level and it's going to look for those MAC addresses and it's going to communicate on that, that layer two concept. 
Whereas if we start going into offices, let's say, and you start using your laptop and you're trying to connect to a server in the data center, you type in an IP address and perhaps you're on a 192.168.1.10 address and the IP address of the server is 10.10.10.10. You know, they're a different numbering schema, so naturally they're not going to be on the same flat subnet. So then that's when routing comes into play. And then that could be a single hop. You know, you go to what's called your default gateway, which is your first hop. And then once it goes there, it then uses that computer network to route across one, 10, 20. It can be as many devices as you like to get to that final endpoint where it hits, where it hits that server. And that communication is obviously bidirectional. So the computer hitting the server it has to know kind of that directionality and then the server back to the computer to relay that information that was requested. And that concept goes as far as as the internet. And again, like um, Mystica says, you know, whether you're sending WhatsApp messages, all of that is essentially routed between servers. So that communication is bidirectional. I think this really simplified uh, the how basically various systems communicate together in network. Uh, Marino, Mystica, do you have anything to add here on this particular topic? Yeah, um, I, I'd like to offer an, an another perspective, and I love the perspective Chris shared as well. Um, so, you know, it kind of starts with electrical signals. Um, you know, uh, an electrical signal can come through, and that can represent a one versus a zero where nothing is coming through. But when you do that many, many times, you can actually create data out of that. That actually will be data. Now, this is actually how uh, devices on a network actually truly communicate. But it's interesting because we don't sit there and program ones and zeros. We actually program logic on these devices, whether it's an iPad or an actual device that routes our traffic for our iPad. Um, so we actually look at this in layers. And Chris, Chris kind of touched on it. Um, there's something called the OSI model uh, or the Open Systems Interconnect model, which actually represents... Um, a flow of how traffic would move from one direction to another or one point to another and what actually happens to that traffic as it has to move around. So what really goes on is an electrical signal is encapsulated in, in some, some sort of hardware information, which is identifying of who owns that hardware, who sent that electrical signal. But then furthermore, I mean, if you think about it, that hardware address or that hardware, hardware information isn't truly enough for us to make routing decisions or intelligent decisions. So we kind of have to implement another layer of logic where we're using some sort of numbering system, IP addresses. By the way, that hardware address that's sending out electrical signals um, on a network actually has something called a MAC address. Um, but the thing is that MAC address is, is kind of long and complex to understand. And so we'll simplify that with a logical address called an IP address, which is another layer that sits on top of this whole hardware and electrical signal layer. Now, interestingly enough, if you, if you think about phone numbers, right? Imagine having to remember like all the phone numbers of your 500 friends or, you know, better yet, imagine if you had like, as many followers as Siam has, which is, I think, 20,000 followers uh, or plus maybe 30,000. I don't know. I haven't looked at Siam's followers. Um, but if you think about that, if he had to remember everyone's phone number, that's going to not very scale, scale very well at all for his you know, memory. Um, and so he'll have a phone book or something that he can reference. So if you think about IP addresses and many, many devices living in many, many networks, it's kind of hard to remember all of these addresses. So what do we do? We actually assign names to them. Um, we give them names, something that's readable by all of us. So if you ever you know, used a website, like I'm sure all of us have, like twitter.com, that, that is a name for an IP address. Um, but that IP address is telling of how do we, like, you know, where it is, what it is, and how do we get to it. Um, so when we think of networking, you, you kind of want to also think of it as, as layers where something is sending electrical signals, but those electrical signals are actually translating to data being sent on a wire. Who is originating that data? Who is sending it? How do we identify who that individual is well we can using some sort of logical address but hey there's so many logical addresses out there maybe we slap a name on it and with that name we're now able to determine how to get there or 
you know, who that person is. How to get there is actually a very interesting story because you kind of need to know, you need to know people, right? So for example, Siam or even Mystica, they know people that I probably want to talk to. I don't know these people directly, but I can reach out to either Siam or Mystica and say, hey, can you uh, introduce me to this individual? And they could be like, yeah, sure, absolutely. Or maybe no, hell no, we're not going to do that. You know, I don't know what you're going to do with that person over there. You might, um, uh, I don't know, right? So maybe I don't want to allow that connection to occur or something like that. But what, what that actually is, is the element of routing. So we've identified who's who, how do we get to them is routing. And so we have these devices called routers that exist in our network that just tell us how to get to these you know, various points of the network or various networks altogether. Because guess what? You know, a true internet is made up of a bunch of network of network of networks. That's really how it is. And at the end of all of these networks are endpoints, which are computers or servers or an iPad or an iPhone or an Android or maybe a smart car or something like that. But that's, you know, kind of my perspective of that whole networking stack. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering Marino and Chris. Uh, this actually really simplified the concept of how you know various systems communicate together. Uh, Mystica, do you have a perspective on this? Yeah. So when you send uh, when you send a message to your friend, then um, these messages that you're writing in the plain text, there is a hello world. So these will be converted into something called a binary. Then your router will have um, a wire connected, a cable connected to it. So that that will be like either uh, fiber optic cables or any other any other cables that trans that sends your data in form of like for example if it is a fiber optic then it will be translate translating via the light so if the light is on we can able to find it is a one and if the light is off we can able to find that as a zero so that's how the the data will be trans translated and uh, in order to translate the data that we need to make sure that two connect two computers are uh, or on like uh, an agreement with each other. So um, we need we have something called a NIC card. There is a network interface card that allows us to make a request. So the MAC address, um, the MAC the MAC address is MAC, MAC the NIC card has this MAC address that helps to communicate through that. So yeah. That's great. Thank you so much for summarizing that, Mystica. And before jumping on to the next one, I just want to say that uh, a pinned has been tweet. Uh, a pin, uh, a tweet has been pinned on the Twitter space above. So if anyone wants to ask their questions, they don't want to speak, and so they can definitely leave their questions on the pinned tweet, and we'll definitely have a Q and A session at the end of the Twitter space. We'll we'll take questions from the audience as well. All right. So uh, Marino and Chris, you mentioned you know, how basically systems communicate together through electrical signals, right? Electrical signals being transferred from one system to another. I believe there are certain kind of devices that maybe in between that, you know, bridge the gap between these two systems. Uh, I remember that uh, Marino mentioned about a router that is, you know, does the routing part of things, but there are other devices such as one is called as a switch. Uh, another one is called as, you know, Something is called as internet service provider. So maybe we can touch upon the topic of you know the devices that is used to provide this kind of connectivity among the network. So yeah, that is the next topic that we want to touch upon. Uh, who would like to go for this one? Mystica. Go for it, uh, Marino. Chris. Okay, Marino, go for it. Yeah. Oh wow! I just went on a, an awesome rant about this stuff. So <laughs> um, yeah, switch. So. You know, th there's a lot of interesting things that go on in the world of networking and specifically, you know, the way we move packets around uh, is really dictated by the hardware we have available. Um, and so one of the one of the very interesting things that has happened over like the last decade is how fast our networks got. What that means is like we went from, you know, let's say a decade ago, we had like one gig networks, which was kind of becoming the norm in the data center or even like getting to the point where it can show up at homes to, you know, 
it was everywhere and 10 gig was starting to become the norm to the point that data centers now actively run 100 gig links everywhere. But this was all made possible through hardware like advancements and innovation through a concept called ASICs. Um, ASICs, I can't remember what it stands for. Um, it'll come to me eventually. Maybe Chris will probably recall it. But the idea, or even Mystica, but the idea is that it's, it's a chip on a switch, a device that will pretty much move electrical signals, but very, very quickly. It can process them and move them very quickly. But a switch ultimately allows you to create these very very high speed networks and allows you to connect multiple devices together because here's what's happening. There's no real routing logic occurring in, in, in what we call a switch. So for a lot of you at home, right, you might use a wireless network or you might have this device that shows up in your home. Um, and when you look at the back of it, it might have one port that says when and multiple ports says ports that say LAN. Um, the interesting thing about, about the um, you know the, those LAN ports is when you connect devices into it, they all automatically become a part of the same network because you are logically grouping them together. Um, now this is representative of the switch, a physical switch, and so what's interesting is among that physical switch in that little isolated network, um, you can you can communicate very very quickly. Now, interestingly enough, switches will come in various sizes. They won't just be four ports at the back plus a WAN port. You'll probably find switches that come in 24-port format, 48-port format. You'll find these massive chassis with switches, which are just effectively trying to move data at line rate. And why that is is because a lot of the intelligence is removed. We, the, like the, the decision is so specific that we don't need to worry about you know, what about this condition or what about that condition? Let's just move packets. And why this happened was because we started to realize that a lot more logic can be implemented in software or at higher levels or even in routing for that matter, for that matter. But here's what it comes down to. When you want to have a network or you want to create a network, what are you going to do? You're either going to procure a switch or maybe a wireless network, and you're going to connect devices into that network, forming a local network. When that local network needs to connect to other networks, that's when you need a router. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Marino. Uh, Chris would like to discuss about router or any other devices that are you know, used to provide this kind of connectivity. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, an excellent starting point for the switches. From a network engineer's uh, perspective, you always start at the low end of what we call the OSI model, and kind of switching is that first, the, the physical and the and then the switches, those first kind of steps that you you go up when you're transmitting data, and the next one up would be things like the like the router. So, like Marino says, the most switches come with a, an ASIC logic, and that's just to so kind of storm store MAC addresses and forward those packets around as quickly as physically possible. And that would be done mostly within the same VLAN. Um, if you want to pass traffic between VLANs or up into the cloud, then the next step is that router. And most routers would be, you know, they wouldn't have that ASIC logic most of the time, unless there's a kind of a combination switch router thing, but we'll avoid that for now. And those routers will sit there and they'll, they'll have CPU and RAM and essentially they'll, they'll have these packets forwarded up to them because the default gateway is programmed on the router. And once it hits that default gateway, the router's job is to understand where that packet needs to be sent next. So if it receives the packet, the chances are it's not meant for anything on its local network, on its local VLAN or VLANs. So it's going to have to send it out of either a specific interface. So a router could have multiple switches connected to it connecting to different networks. So it could be as simple as it receives the packet in interface one and goes, oh, hey, I know where that network is. That's outside of interface two. Let me just throw that in there. Or it could be out of interface three because it knows the network is over there. So it could be as simple as that. Or it could be things like, oh, I don't know where this is, so I'm going to have to pass it up to my next router. So you can kind of daisy chain those routers as well. So you can have larger networks. So multiple switches can be daisy chained, multiple routers can be daisy chained 
So once you're passing that data to a router, it's essentially just looking in what it's called its root table, which is built from its um, forwarding database. So it'll collect all the routes that it could possibly learn and then create a routing table out of that. And then that routing table will say, these routes are out of this interface, these routes are out of that interface. And it'll kind of have that database and have that kind of stored and cached. So any packet that it gets, it can quickly make a decision and fire it out of the correct interface. The way it learns about all these routes can happen in multiple different ways. So you can program them statically and you can say, you know, out of this interface, I want this network, this interface, I want this network. And this one is the router's default gateway, for example. So if I don't know where it's going to go and I don't know the endpoint or where their endpoint resides, I'm going to just throw it at the in this interface, which is typically the ISP interface. So you would have that default gateway pointing up there. Another way to do it is using what we call dynamic routing protocols. So you can set up things like BGP or OSPF, uh, EIGRP. Those might be familiar to some of the listeners. And essentially what they do is if you configure those on a number of neighboring routers, they can communicate with each other. So if you have router A that has network 10.10.10 and you have router B that has network 10.10.20 and they're connected and there's BGP running or OSPF or EIGRP, you can ask them to share their routes. So B would say, oh, hey, you've got 10. I'm going to store that in my database. And if I need it, I'll just forward the packets to you. Likewise, router A will say, oh, hey, you have 20. If I have anything for 20, I'll just send it to you because I know you have it there. So there's kind of that dynamic learning protocol. And then you can have those routes shared. And as those network grows, those tables can become quite large, quite complex. So dynamic routing protocols do help. And then I'll kind of leave a few devices for Mystique. Yeah, so on the router, we'll be having something called a modern video. So it converts the analog signal into the digital signal so that we can able to like read it. We can able to convert the binary to our, our human understandable form. And uh, I, I'm not sure, but nowadays our home home router always, uh, I think it have a switch inbuilt on it. So I'm not sure about that. Who are, uh, are you guys sure that uh, the router have the switch inbuilt on it? Yeah, so the home routers will have like a combination of a switch slash router. So the, the logic is kind of meshed together. <laughs> it's yeah. a weird concept. Yeah. I don't know much about that. So yeah, that's all. Interesting. I, I really didn't know that uh, the router that we have at home has an uh, inbuilt switching system in that. So that's pretty interesting. Thanks for sharing, everyone. And uh, let's let's talk about an interesting scenario, right? And this topic, I, I believe, uh, Marino touched a bit before while answering a question. But I always wondered when I you know got started with learning about computer networking that what exact, how am I able to, you know, redirect to a particular website when I search on the web browser? So for example, you type youtube.com or you are typing twitter.com. How is it able to, you know, connect to that particular, that particular server and not just any other random server available on the internet, right? So I believe uh, the topic concept of IP addresses and DNS uh, domain name system comes here, right? Uh, Marino touched upon this topic a bit, but if we could have a lot more discussion on this particular one, that would be great. So Chris would like to start this one. Yeah, sure. Um, it's quite funny. This, uh, if you apply to one of the cloud providers, this is quite a common question, which is it's, it's quite a good one to, to talk through. Um, yeah. When you, when you're typing in things in your browser, I mean, YouTube being the obvious one, um, YouTube, is essentially a service running on an IP address, but we're never gonna remember those IP addresses because they're a number of digits long with um, points in between them. So it could be anything from 195.207.7. It's just too long to remember. So this is where the DNS system comes in. So it's a domain name service system. And essentially what you do is when you type it in into your into your browser, it does a number of things. So I'll type in YouTube into my Chrome browser and it will first check the, the local cache on the, on the laptop or the machine you're using. Maybe that's an iPad, for example. So 
what it'll do is it'll say, hey, this, this user's typed in youtube.com, but I, I don't know what IP address that is. Do, do you know local machine? It'll say, no, I don't know what it is. You're going to have to go out to your DNS server. So on every machine, you configure a number of things, IP address, subnet mask, default gateway, and a DNS server. And that DNS server is used to translate names into IP addresses for you. So once the, the local cache doesn't know where it is, it's first going to go, okay, let me go check my local DNS server. So what it's going to do is it's going to fire out a request to its local DNS server, which is typically run by your local ISP. Or if you're in a company, it'll go to your company DNS. It'll look for a resolution. It'll say, hey, again, I've got YouTube.com. Do you know the IP address? If it's not held there or cached there, it'll go forward and say, look, um, I'm going to have to branch out and ask for this answer for you. A lot of the time, uh, if you're working, if you're pinging an ISP for this address, it will be cached because YouTube is such a common, common URL. You know, maybe perhaps if you're using an uncommon URL, it'll say, no, I'm going to need to branch out and ask for this information. So what it kind of does is it goes out to, I can't remember the exact name for them, but it'll reach out to the owners of the domain. It'll reach out to the, the owners of that domain. So it'll be like, for example, youtube.com. Hey, I'm looking for youtube.com. Who has, who has this IP address? And there'll be a list of known domain servers that are kind of the, the masters. I'm searching for the word, but someone can correct me if I'm wrong. The root name servers? The what, sorry? The root name servers? That's it, root name servers. So it'll go towards the root name servers and say, hey, um, based on the registry of this domain, youtube.com, you're meant to be the overall master of this domain. What's the IP address? It'll give that IP address goes back to the ISP's DNS. It'll install it in cache for a certain amount of time. It'll install it on your local machine cache, and then finally it'll forward it to the browser and say, hey, this is the IP address you want. The great thing is the browser doesn't then change to an IP address. It keeps that kind of URL, but in the background, it's using that IP address. So I think I stole everyone's answer there, but uh, I'm sure people can elaborate on what I've said. Well, there's uh, there's actually some more interesting parts to this, right? Like we we also tra we'll, we'll translate these addresses into IP addresses or host names into addresses, vice versa. Um, but what about like the higher layers, like HTTP, and what actually goes on there? So it's interesting because it's not just like you know the the DNS name that I can pop into a browser. There's actually something else going on there, um, and this this concept of HTTP is introduced you know, this way that we actually communicate with, with web elements. And I actually want to ask Mystica about it because this is, you know, higher level or layer seven networking at this point. And she wrote a great like blog post on what HTTP is. Mystica, you want to talk about that? Yeah. So yeah, when you go to the URL and type uh, youtube.com and you can be able to see and uh, an icon called the connection is secure. So we can able to understand that that uses HTTPS. So I'm gonna go a uh, little history about the HTTP a bit. So uh, the first we have something called HTTP 0.9. So that is introduced by the Tim Berners-Lee, if I'm not wrong. So that initially, it's um, it it is developed to transfer the HTML file. So that that is how it got the name Hypertext Markup Protocol. So it is uh, initially it is used to like uh, send the research paper from the one university to another university or a military basis. So that's like that they call it as a one line net one line protocol. We just have like a GET request to GET with um, get and what the, what is the name of the HTML file that we needed. So the server will, will, will process that request and give back to us. So initially the web was not built for communicating via the audio or video or anything. So we needed something better. So we switched to something called HTTP1. Um, the HTTP1 uh, was standardized and it, it, uh, it introduced some other uh, key uh, status code, status code, I think, it's like a get post and uh, op get post and options were introduced. And next up, we had something called 
so tc we have something called at uh, the http on the low on the under the hood it works on the basis of the tcp so it performs the handshakes and it initiates the connection so for example if you're requesting for a html file that is on the server a and i need to have the html uh, HT, html file so I'll, i'll be as a client i'll be requesting at the next will be requesting something called a css file and the js file will be there so we'll be requesting like um, i'll be requesting one by one so the connection will take like a more more time then we can't able to like uh, wait wait for a long time to process just one html file so that this is called a line of head blocking this like blocks the one net, one rec, uh, one request until uh, the response came so next up we have something they introduced to avoid this the http2 so this uses something something called uh, and initially the security was not built into the html http so we use something called a tls or ssl in order to verify that uh, i'm getting the html file from the correct server so these these protocols helps us to make sure the identity of identity of the server then uh, on the http2 it is like build on to it so it works with the uh, tls and uh, ssl so this http2 instead of making um, in, instead of waiting for the one file to get uh, in one, one html file to get then we in, and after we get that we'll be requesting the css and after we get that we'll be requesting the js js file instead of doing that we can like parallelly send uh, we can parallelly send the request to the server that i need uh, this html i need the css i need the js and it will come so it will come as the uh, as the server process it so that is that what we did in the http2 and now they are introducing something called http3 so it's going to be a standard pretty soon um and this uh, the http stack would initially was built on under the hood of the tcp now we uh, we are in the http3 we are using the udp protocol uh, udp uh, udp based protocol that is uh, that is called like a quick protocol that was standardized this year so um this quick protocol ensures that we deliver the they deliver the network fast because the tcp is reliable we need to do the handshake and in case of the udp we don't need to do the handshake so it will be more faster to do the uh, to get the request and send the response so that's how that's the history of the http Thanks for sharing uh, Mystic and Chris. Marino, do you have anything to add here? No. Awesome. I I believe we have covered a lot of important concepts while answer, while answering this particular question. And in a layman language, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I would say that the an IP address and the domain name system works hand in hand when we talk about, you know, connecting to a particular server when we write something on the URL in our browser. so let, let's just extend this uh, concept of ip addresses right and let me ask you a question uh, the developers in the audience would connect to this while we are uh, you know developing a particular application in our system we use something called as a local host right so the format for that is local host colon and some four digit number is written like 3000 or 8080 which is called a port number so what is the difference between the ip addresses that we just talked about and the port number when we see you know developing locally on our system what's the basic difference between those if you can touch upon that who would like to go for this one sure i can take this one yeah sure uh, yeah so when you look at an ip address um it's it's just a way to reference a particular node on your network but then you also have to consider ways that you can connect to services that exist on that node um so you might have a web service on a node or a, a computer you might have like this online app or you might have something that needs to communicate with another object on a different network so you have different streams of connections 
coming out of your computer or into your computer. So you need a way to distinguish them. And one of the ways to distinguish them is by using port numbers. Now, you might be familiar with well-known port numbers like port 80, which is representative of HTTP, or port 443, which is HTTPS. Um, some of you might know UDP port 53, which is representative of DNS. Um, but these port numbers are basically indicative of a service that we're attempting to access on a given system. So whenever you specify, like, let's say, localhost port 8080, what you're effectively doing is on the local host that you're on, you're trying to access a service on port 8080 because that service is only accessible on that port. Um, you can make it a default port if you want to. So if you remove the 8080, automatically it goes to that service. But what if you have a thousand other services existing on your system? You need a way to connect to each one of them. And this is why port numbers exist. Um, it's also a very clever way to um, allow and disallow connections to those particular ports. So in the world of security and networking, you may want to lock down ports that don't need to be open. These are, these are ways that you can connect into your, your system, your app. And then think about it this way. If I have a way to enter into your system through some open port, then I can, I can basically take advantage of that. I can manipulate parts of the system. I can basically hack the system at that point. And so normally what occurs is now you lock down ports. You close off ports that don't need to be open. So a really good analogy for this is, imagine if you had a front door, right, that allowed you in and out of your house. And then behind that front door, you had a mesh. You know those, like some doors have meshes and stuff like that just to prevent flies or, or anything. But imagine like those holes were actually bigger and things could actually get through. If you didn't have a mechanism to block those holes off, things would come into your house whenever you left the front door open. So what you would want to do is somehow find a way to maybe, you know, make those holes really small um, or only allow these, these really, really tiny holes for a little bit of airflow to come through. Um, but that's effectively what you're doing with a system. You're trying to close off unnecessary open systems or ports that you don't need. Um, so in your system, in the local host example, right, you can access a service on a given port, but if you try to access that service on any other port, it won't be accessible. And this is just how you hook things or you wire things up. So the, the more relatable term um, is actually something called network address translation is a way to actually allow one IP address to be used by multiple services or multiple endpoints. Um, and if you do this in like, you know, campus networking or data center networking, you might be familiar with something called NAT overload or port address translation, but that's effectively all it is. It's a way to distinguish what service we're accessing when we have a single IP. That's great. And I, I believe, Marino, you pretty much summarized in this concept in a very easy manner. And I really hope that the audience would have understood this particular topic, but if Mystica and Chris, you want to touch upon this, maybe provide a, another perspective, you may please do so. Anything to add here? Yeah, I think um, Marina covered it covered it really well. Uh, a lot of things, a lot of times when people talk about ports, they're talking about the the server access, for example, um, the common ones that, that Marina mentioned. Um, but as well as it's interesting when you make your request to a server. Let's say you're going to a well-known port on 443, which is HTTPS, or SSH, which is 22. When you're making that request out, you're actually you're specifying a port as well. So that's the destination port, and you're also specifying a source port. So that could be that's typically a random random number over 10,000, for example. So that's the way these these routers, these firewalls, uh, these load balancers, those kind of things, that's the way they keep track of your session to know who is who. What IP address is it coming from and what port is it coming from? So it's coming from your IP address and your random port going to google.com on port 443. So that quad bit of information, the four pieces of information there, tallies up quite nicely. And that's how they do session tracking so they can see who is coming from where and stuff. So that data is transmitted back and forth quite 
quite nicely. That's all I had to add. Mystica, anything to add here? No. Awesome. I have, I yeah, I believe that we have covered this topic in quite a bit of you know descriptive manner, and I believe that the audience would have definitely got an idea. All right. I believe we have you know covered uh, many important concepts related to computer networking as a whole. But now let's jump into something interesting and connect this with the DevOps and cloud native ecosystem, right? So according to you all, if you know how a network engineer or someone with a, a, a certain amount of knowledge about computer networking, what do you think would uh, will they be able to understand Kubernetes and containers in a better manner? Or you know, if I reframe the question, why do you think that uh, the concept of computer networking is important for someone who wants to get started with DevOps or are involved in the ecosystem? So yeah, that's the question. Uh, Let's start with Mystica this time. Mystica, I would like to go ahead. I'm not sure, sure about the DevOps, so yeah. All right, no worries. But maybe you can discuss like why are these concepts important for someone in any field, not exactly DevOps, in any field, why is it important for someone to have a knowledge of computer networking? Yeah, so in case of like if you're developing an application, you need to find a way to improve the performance of the app, right? So we need to make uh, make a request in the optimized manner so that we can able to like uh, uh, avoid the waiting time. So we can uh, we can able to reduce that, avoid the waiting time, and we can able to make a request in a manner that it will like. Uh, we can avoid the round trip that needed to connect to the server and get the request and then return back. So it, I think it is important for a, as a developer to know how, how to optimize the network and make a use of it so that we can able to like uh, uh, create an application in a good manner and it will perform pretty well with the lower latency. So, yeah. Got it. Thank you so much for answering, Mystica. Uh, Marino, Chris, would like to provide a perspective on this one? Yeah, I can go. Um, I mean, speaking from a network engineering, network architecting background, I hope it's very important. Um, you know, that's my background. That I like to think it's important, but um, I may be somewhat biased in my response. Um, when you're looking at things like DevOps and when you're looking at things like Kubernetes, I think it's important to have a good understanding of networking because much like any other system, like any other applications, whether it's physical machines, virtual machines, whether it's containers, they all do have to communicate. Albeit Kubernetes is, is slightly more involved, slightly more complex, um, probably because the concepts are so much newer rather than the fact they are wildly complex. So it's just kind of getting around and trying to understand them. But I think having that that base of, of networking knowledge has helped me understand how VMs, how containers communicate. So when I'm reading about concepts about, the con, about containerization, there are a lot of similarities that I can draw from that kind of speed up the learning process for me. So... For example, uh, an easy one is load balancing in the physical world is, is somewhat similar to that of the virtual world, although it can be a little different, but the concepts still apply. And it's very similar in, in Kubernetes. I mean, there are, there are different flavors and different ways you can load balance kind of between applications and different pods, but the concepts still apply and having that base understanding does help. It would be the same as if you came from a storage background knowing physical and virtualization storage is only ever going to help you when you move into the Kubernetes word world. And it's the same with the compute. Um, having a good, well-rounded understanding of the IT infrastructure is good. Obviously, I, I, I think everyone's going to have their specialization. So, you know, try to have a, a well-rounded education from an IT perspective, but specialize in your area, whether it be networking, storage, compute, um, coding, wh whatever it is, but try to understand um, the the basis of it, but I think network, networking is a 
is a very nice to have because it's one of those things that most people will point at if something breaks. So it's nice to be able to to troubleshoot that quickly and have that understanding of no, it's definitely not the network. Let's move on. Or yes, I think it is. Let's try and troubleshoot this a bit deeper. That's great. Thank you so much for answering, Chris. Uh, Marino, anything to add here? Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, so, uh, several thoughts, right? Kubernetes is a is a highly distributed system, um, and so knowing networking, knowing how all of these different components inside of Kubernetes connect and operate to get, like together, is is very powerful, right? Like having that understanding is solid. And really, what it comes down to is, look, different components inside of Kubernetes will communicate over certain ports, just like how we expect normal things in either the virtual world or even the physical world to communicate. It's no different. Um, but Kubernetes is an entirely different breed altogether because of what it's trying to aiming to do or what it's aiming to do. Let's back up a bit, right? How did we get to container networking or Kubernetes networking? Um, we decided actually more specifically, the world of software decided that we wanted to iterate, make changes quickly, adapt quickly, you know, recover from failures very quickly as well. And so while having to leave certain things behind, certain ideas and thoughts behind, we had to pick up new patterns. One of those patterns happened to be a just-in-time network. When I deploy a new piece of software, a network should just be deployed very quickly. And that, that concept came with virtualization because this wasn't easily achieved in the physical world. Like procurement of physical devices from a vendor, you're talking days, weeks, months even at times. But when it comes to the virtual world, when the resources are, are in front of you and you can do things in software very quickly, well, you can present yourself with a just-in-time network. But we all know, you know, when we when we talk about DevOps, we're really today talking about things like containers and Kubernetes. So if we're creating these very small units of compute to run our applications, we need to be able to create that network, but at the same time destroy that network very quickly. Because here's here's the reality: like certain workloads will have a a short-lived period of time certain other workloads will live for forever. But then we also have to accommodate for situations of resiliency. Like what happens when hardware just breaks? What happens to our applications? How do we recover from that? So Kubernetes, as an example, there are other mechanisms as well, but Kubernetes as an example reconciles pretty, pretty well because of this concept of desired state. So, hey, I want you to do this. I want you to always do this. And Kubernetes is like, okay, I'll always do this because you told me you always wanted me to do this. Um, and what that might translate to is if you tell it to run a container, an application, it will always try to make sure that given resources available, hardware available, it'll always try to run you know, that, that application. When, when it disappears or when something disappears, well, what does Kubernetes have to do? make sure that application comes back to life. But what, it, what does it also have to do? It has to call on the network. It has to create a network for it just in time for when it comes online. And so it'll do that for you automatically. And so what has actually shifted is that we have to move away from, or like networking has you know, moved away from having persistent IP addresses. Um, and we've gravitated to using more DNS, using DNS to identify our workloads. And you know, on top of that, using labels to help us make intelligent policy decisions or routing decisions. Um, so this, this actually is a, a complete shift from how we used to do networking. We still retain a lot of those fundamentals in the sense of, hey, um, you know, a pod still needs an IP address because it's still communicating. We still need a load balancer because we'll have multiple copies of this application and we need to make sure that all of them are responding and we'll you know, have a adequate response time. But these fundamental network technologies still exist today. They just have been you know, made super small, super lightweight, easy to deploy inside of the stack, inside of the Kubernetes stack or a container orchestration stack. You know, I'll be real, Kubernetes want. Kubernetes is out there. Um, a lot of you will like be like, what the heck is this guy talking about? But if we're talking about compute workloads where we can spin them up very quickly, network them very quickly, Kubernetes is it. Um, what does that mean in terms of deploying a network? Okay, so you still need a physical network because these servers 
need to send data to each other. Okay, so that'll always exist, but that that network won't always change as much. It's not not going to change as often anymore because we don't need to touch it. We'll do a lot of our real networking inside of the virtual layer. But quite honestly, when you actually look at the virtual layer, maybe we don't even need to do anything there because virtual machines as a small chunk of an actual physical piece of hardware, um, which serves up an operating system, will come and go as well based off of our needs, right? Based off of the way we approach DevOps. Um, containers, same policy, they'll come and go. Hardware will stick around and the only time it'll actually be cycled out is if it fails or if for whatever reason it's just aged out and we just need to refresh it. But all of this idea of you know, automation, right? Using containers to build applications in small chunks um, and then always ensure a just-in-time network means that we're now writing network in code, in software. Um, that doesn't mean we're adding networking to our applications. It's just that our networking now aligns to whenever we make changes pretty darn quickly. Um, we're not tinkering with physical networks anymore or as often as much anymore um, because, you know, quite honestly, what I said earlier, Kubernetes is doing a lot of this for us. Sorry, I've, I've spoken for quite a lot. I know I've emphasized Kubernetes a lot. Um, but it's, it's a stack that actually makes networking simplified and allows you to get complex if you want it to. And there are other technologies that layer in that are pretty representative of networking technologies from 10 years ago. I'll stop there. It was really great listening to you, Marino. And thank you so much, everyone, for answering this question. And yeah, I, I totally agree with the point that networking is, I believe that in the cloud native space, and even if we are talking generally in the development side of things, networking has a really special part in whichever technology or tool we are exploring. So if, again, I go to the beginner side of things and talk related to that, what for someone who just wants to learn all of these concepts, right? So what kind of environment or what kind of environment or a lab or how should they set up their local system basically? Are there any essential tools that they require to download or that they require to install or how should they basically set up their home environment if they want to learn these concepts? Maybe we can touch upon this topic next. So yeah, I want to just go um, because I, I also don't want to jump into certification stuff yet or at all. Um, but I, I originally would have thought of, hey, you know, maybe procure equipment and build out your network. But actually, the best way to start is, you know, if you've got a spare computer, install Linux. Um, and the reason why I say that is because a lot of this stuff today that we do, especially when it comes to networking, is going to use some form of Linux out there. So get familiar with it. Learn how to use the networking tools inside of Linux like DIG, which is something for DNS, like IP, which is something to specify IP addressing information or even capture IP information of your local host. Um, get familiar with using tools like TCP dump so you can understand the traffic flow. Get familiar with tools like curl so that you can understand how to interact with um, HTTP and make requests. Understand HTTP status codes. Like these are things that you probably want to now start with because um, I'll be real, right? You're not going to be sitting there wiring up a network daily anymore. You might um, be for like a short amount of time for a contract or something like that. But the reality is if you're actually developing or deploying networks, um, you're going to need some familiarity with how this stuff is built in Linux. So you'll you'll then stumble upon things like network namespaces, and then network namespaces will lead you to things like containers and container networking and even Kubernetes networking, because this is pretty much the way forward. And then things like load balancers, firewalls, um, API gateways, service meshes will then start to really, you know, flourish in your mind, because really it all starts with the Linux operating system. Got it. Thank you so much for answering, Marino. Uh, Chris, Mar Mystica, would you like to provide another perspective here? Yeah. So the 
if if you if you are on windows installing the tools like wireshark has been very helpful for me to learn about the new protocols so it doesn't have to be like too or too tedious so just set uh, just start the wireshark and just go and browse something like uh, youtube or uh, or a twitter and you can able to see the all the protocols there and uh, and you can able to see what happens on the inside like you can able to see the tcp packets and udp or quick packets and we can able to see what or how the requests are like going inside uh, inside and so the wireshark has been very helpful for me and if you have like a lot of of a uh, vast amount of time the rfcs were very helpful for me to learn more about the networks so it just go on to the rfcs and read about the tcp and ip stack so there is a, lo- a lot of drama that happened to where we are right now because of what happened on a paper so uh, these rfcs and wireshark and the tools like the linux and the command line tools are very helpful when you're learning the networking so yeah yeah I'll, i'll kind of compound on that as well i don't i don't really want to talk about the certification path at this point either um linux wireshark they're, they're great ideas to understand the type of traffic flows and and marino's 100% correct in most things are built on linux now um even physical devices have a have a flavor of linux on them um so i think that's a, a terrific piece of advice if you're looking to go down a kind of more traditional sense of a uh, learning computer networks and you you know you want to go down that engineer network engineer route that kind of thing then you can use tools such as gns3 which is good it's uh, essentially a it's a program that allows you to virtualize physical networks you can do things like use vmware hands on labs to learn things like nsx uh using that linux machine that that marino talked about you can actually set up small networks within the linux os uh, and then obviously you have all your cloud repositories you can go on aws google azure and stuff and and work on those those from a free concept perspective kubernetes you've got some cool things like c3 that allow you to spin up small kubernetes concepts and work work on the networking piece there 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 are tons of things to to play with um i'm not a huge fan as much anymore of sitting down and and doing a certification to learn these things although i i do think that gives you a well rounded kind of education um from a networking or w- whatever concept um but reading some material reading some blogs reading some chapters from books that kind of thing and then once you need them and once you want to use them diving into different chapters i think that that really helps um that's the way i learn it's more from a video concept it's more from a uh, reading chapters or blogs that kind of concept so that's what i find is very useful and then once i learn something i go and try it whether it be kubernetes networking virtual uh, sdn networking or or physical networking Awesome. Thank you so much for answering this question. Uh, and it really cleared a lot of my doubts that I had in my mind. And another question that we get quite a lot and this is something very personal to me is I believe that uh, when someone gets started, you know, learning about these networking concepts, they tend to get stuck in a loop because I, I, to be honest, there is so much to learn. I mean, the topics that we have covered today in the space those would be i don't know like one fourth of the topics that uh, are covered in the whole networking uh, concept so how, the basic question is how much to learn if you know we how to approach uh, computer networking if we want to learn from scratch and we really don't want to you know uh, spend a lot of time on this and stuck get stuck in a loop and you know, just going over through concepts again and again i hope the question was clear and maybe if you could advise suggest any advices on this particular topic yeah I, I, for me when i was learning um i did my ccna and ccmp um i don't think all the technologies kind of make sense in today's world uh, especially if you're kind of trying to fast track into 
maybe a cloud native or a DevOps kind of space. You know, things like spanning tree just don't make sense. MPLS doesn't make sense to learn. So I think maybe, or just having like a broad understanding. So rather than sitting, let's say, a CCNA course, you can get these kind of condensed books that are, you know, CCA, CCNA in a week where they just overview a number of topics quickly. And then obviously learning learning specific topics, you can deep dive in the areas that interest you most. But I, I would probably start maybe with something like that and then start playing in your specific field. Um, so, for example, if you're doing cloud native stuff, you know, play on AWS, play on Azure, play on GCP. Or if you're doing Kubernetes, install your own cluster and, and play around, install an application and try and try and do different things, you know, uh, police traffic, load balance, that kind of thing. Uh, that, that would be my recommendation in a fast track kind of method anyway. I see Marino has raised his hand. Marino? Yeah, you know, I I actually lost a little faith in Cisco for a while um, because I thought that they weren't going in the right direction from an education standpoint until I stumbled upon their DevNet stuff, which is uh, quite interesting. So they've actually built out a really interesting program for De- DevOps engineers who really want to understand networking better. Or if you actually want to go down the networking path, but don't want to you know, dig into the hardware stuff or anything, but understand things like container networking, service meshes, API gateways, and even like even the basics, the foundational stuff. I think they've actually come up with a program, but I'll also like throw a few plugs. Like quite honestly, I know Siam has built out a, a few networking courses out there. Um, Kunal has built out some networking courses. Anais has. Um, there's some few folks like Diera um, on Twitter who, are, like, honestly talks about networking quite often. Um, there are some folks that are on TikTok that do networking stuff. Quite honestly, um, one of them is I think not she networks. I can't remember her name. Um, but anyways, I, I think. You know, outside of just like going out and following a bunch of tutorials and 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 whatnot, um, it's also kind of nice to get perspectives around what's actually going on in the networking world as well, what's transpiring. And that's kind of how I've been learning how to just stay afloat, because I'll be real, like I don't touch networking devices or I don't do daily networking. Look, I'm, I'm a developer advocate. I've kind of got to do a lot of different activities and working with tech isn't one of them that I do like quite often enough and specifically networking tech. So when I get a chance, it's like, ooh, great. And then I realize I have to go back and relearn things like BGP all over again, um, which is fun as a process. And then you also realize that BGP is a routing protocol and Internet routing protocol still exists today. So how do I get it to work in Kubernetes um, or with like the Cilium CNI? And then I start going into these very interesting rabbit holes where I'm you know, trying to get things to work and realizing things that I've never realized before. Um, and really what that means is you'll learn best by actually doing. Yeah, totally agree on that part. Learning by doing is the approach that one should follow for everything that they try to learn. Try to apply whatever you are learning. Awesome. Thanks for answering this, Marino. Mystica, would you like to provide another perspective here? Yeah, they both summed up perfectly. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I, I think we are at the, uh, we are just upon the end for this questions section of this Twitter space. The last, and I believe, again, one of the uh, interesting questions, and I, I totally believe that the audience would be waiting for this one. What are some of the best resources or places uh, one could visit or have in order to you know get started with learning all these particular concepts. So yeah, if you could share those as well. I don't know. Would you like to go ahead with this? I'm again uh, putting my, you on the spot. Yeah, my <laughs> mind is all over the place in terms of like resources. Honestly, YouTube. YouTube's probably the place you want to start if you want to just learn the basics of networking first and foremost. I mean. Learning the the basics is really just learning the theoretical concepts. Um, And, you know, the best way to do that is by actually going to YouTube and picking out a video. I do highly recommend Kunal's video um, on computer networking. Uh, It's, I think, 
roughly four hours long, four and a half hours long, if I'm not mistaken. But it's so solid because it covers a lot of the foundational stuff. And then you decide, you know, you pick your path where you want to go and how you want to proceed forward. Awesome. Uh, Chris would like to go next. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm a I'm a huge fan of YouTube. That place has the answers to most things. You just type it in, you'll get someone with a five minute video, someone with a twenty minute video. Uh, I really like that idea. That's a, a lot of what I do. I'll watch someone do something or code something for twenty minutes and then go away and try it myself. I find that I personally find that the the easiest way to learn. Um, accompanying with blogs, a lot of these guys that that produce YouTube content also have a link to their blog, so you kind of can read what they're talking about and copy bits and pieces of their code and things like that. That I find really useful. Um, I found things like a cloud guru, Udemy have some nice courses as well. They're a bit more structured and a bit more focused towards maybe a qualification, but um, I found them, them quite useful. Them quite useful as well. And you can get uh, these courses quite heavily discounted as well, uh, which is good. Those are, those are the key, key methods for me. And as well as the, I think Marino would and Mystica would say the community is really good as well. Shooting a question out on Twitter or asking for a specific resource or, you know, if someone, if you know someone's good at a specific thing, just saying like, Oh, Hey, have you got five minutes to look at this bit of code or joining a Slack channel? There's tons of community Slack channels out there. So yeah, I, I think um, finding ways to communicate with people. And even if all they do is point you to the right YouTube video or the right blog, I think that's a good way to start. That's great. Thanks for sharing, Chris. Mystica, anything to add? Yeah, the YouTube are the best way to learn, and that, that's what I've been doing. And another one is that the, you, can, you can refer to the many books, and you can refer the RFCs, as I said before, and you can go for the podcast or blogs. You can, like, you can use tons of resources online to learn, and you can join the communities, as Chris said. So these are the things that are very helpful to build up the basics. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing these resources, everyone. And yeah, YouTube is, I believe, a center point for all the resources if we talk about any cloud native technology or any concept. Yeah, I think, uh, we, I believe we have covered a lot of interesting concepts today in terms of, you know, computer networking. We covered, uh, like, the fundamental concepts, I believe. So the people in the audience, you would have definitely got a nice overview of what all is included in, you know, if you want to get started with computer networking and learning those concepts. Of course, we can we'll not be able to, you know, uh, cover mo all the topics here because computer networking is really vast. But you would de have definitely got a nice overview. Now, uh, the space is like open for, you know, Q and A. So we'll, you know, we'll be doing a quick Q and A Q and A section here. We'll take a few questions from the folks who want to ask. So. If you want to ask, if you have a question in mind, just raise your hand. I'll invite you to the space and you can ask your questions to the speakers. I see that uh, we have one request. Let me invite. And again, if your question doesn't get answered in the space today, because we are a little bit short on time now, you can definitely leave your question uh, in the tweet thread that we have pinned to the space. So the speakers here would definitely answer that a little bit later as well. Okay. Uh, Vishwa, are you able to hear me? Let's see. Okay, uh, Vishwa has left the space. We have another. Yeah, Adama, are you able to hear me? I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Yes, yes, I'm able to hear you. Awesome. Please go ahead. 
and ask a question. Okay. Uh, my question is for someone who is new into uh, all the Kubernetes and uh, Docker containerization and stuff. So would you advise the person to start with the Docker desktop first or go with uh, the CLI of uh, like those Linux-based environments, CLI, or use the desktop? Interesting. Uh, who would like to answer this question, I believe? Chris would like to go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, so somewhat recently, I did my CKA. Uh, it was part of a, one of the old companies' um, policies. We had to get it. But um, I, I personally found that going for kind of a, a CLI version uh, helped me understand it uh, a little bit more. Um, rather than add a, a base understanding of Docker anyway. So if you do have that kind of basic understanding of Docker and, and the concepts around it and how it works, then I would probably recommend, at least I found it easier to go to that CLI model. Um, I installed a couple of VMs on my machine, just really small. I think they were, you know, one VC, vCPU and two gig of RAM, nothing more. Um, alternatively, you can use a cloud, but using the CLI and, and just starting and building up from that really basic model and just doing like simple manifest files and then building them out and growing. I found that was a, a much easier way to learn than slowly going, kind of going from a GUI into the CLI because I find using the CLI builds from the ground up and then the GUIs kind of complement and speed up the process rather than having to not kind of not know what's going on under the hood, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that would make sense. Awesome. Thank you so much for answering the question, Chris, and thank you so much for asking your question, Adama. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, Vishwa, you are now a speaker. Uh, you may ask your question. Hi, Kunal. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. There's uh, a little bit of disturbance, but it's good. Uh, I have been learning uh, DevOps for uh, past 46 days, and I'm on my own today, and I'm learning Golang with uh, started computer networks. I'm thinking that I'm not getting into uh, contributing to the open source projects. I'm thinking a little weird to contribute to the open source project. A uh, little tough to contribute to the open source projects. Can you suggest some kind of uh, starter projects? Interesting one. Uh, Adama, do you have something to add to this answer? You're raising your hand. Oh, oh no, I was, I was going to ask a question after that. Okay, M maybe we can answer Vishwa's question first and then get back to you. Okay. All right. Uh, I believe, Avinash, you have raised your hand. Yep. So uh, uh, we are starting with a new project, mini project in uh, at Cube Simplify. So maybe you can join us there, uh, join the Discord, and we we do some, we build something great. Yes, absolutely. Uh, feel free to join the Discord server of Cube Simplify, and you can. Definitely get involved in this project, Vishwa. Uh, Marino, Mystica, Chris, anything to add here? Any suggestions you would like to make? So I think uh, with respect to the, the question around the DevOps like journey and whatnot, if you wanted to focus in on something, uh, Michael Cade has something called 90 Days of DevOps. Uh, it's a Git repo that takes you through pretty much like everything. Right, everything that that would show up in the world of DevOps, maybe not everything, but probably like ninety nine point nine 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 percent of it. Um, and then the other one that you probably want to check out is look up the hashtag hundred days of Kubernetes. That's Ni's um, like little adventure she went on to really go deep into Kubernetes and better understand it. Um, and that will also help you like with your DevOps journey. Awesome. Uh, thanks for sharing, Marino. Uh, Vishwa, I hope your question has got answered. And yeah, all the best for contributing to the projects. Adama, would you like to go ahead with your question? And then maybe we can end this space. Okay. Um, 
my question is for someone who has only one one computer one local computer and then you want to uh work with your vms your linux vms so uh for me for example when i try that i try i uh, install like i have vmware and i have um uh, virtual box and then i fire one ubuntu server where i try to do my labs and stuff but uh, the Ubuntu server does not accept nested virtualization on my machine. So I try to go onto like AWS uh, server and try to do over there. But over there also, they don't support VTX. So I don't know if like uh, Chris can kind of, you know, explain a little bit how he went about the, you know, the virtualization on his um, his end locally so that he can be able to fire those stuff like Minikube and all this stuff. Uh, yeah, um, so I used so I used um, VMware Workstation, but that's a paid for product. Uh, I get it free because I'm a V expert. Um, you can use things like VirtualBox, and um, I can't remember. There's another program, and then essentially all all I did was follow a specific guide to. I f followed a specific guide just to install Kubernetes. Um, on the three nodes, I made one master node and two worker nodes. Um, I'll actually paste the blog on the Twitter space thread, so you can you can follow that. Uh, so just keep an eye out there. Um, but yeah, um, there are some other ways that I'll put in as well. Um, I've recently been guided towards, uh, I think it's K3, that is a, a much easier way of installing a, a Kubernetes cluster. I mean, you don't have to do a three node cluster. You don't have to do a master and two nodes. You can just do kind of like a one node cluster, have it like a master node kind of system. Uh, upgrades might be a bit of a pain, but other than that, uh, that should be fine. But um, yeah, I think, uh, I think Marina wants to chime in. Yeah, um, that like that's all actually pretty great stuff, um, Chris. You stole all my answers. <laughs> um, you know, if you actually set up Docker desktop on your system, um, you can actually use it to run a few containers without needing any sort of virtualization layer. Um, but you can even take that a step further um, and you can use something called Kind or Kubernetes in Docker, which allows you to um, use or spin up a Kubernetes cluster locally. Um, but K3Ds or K3s is another alternative as well, which is it, it really comes down to low overhead and use and like utilization. Like you won't have to worry about too much CPU or memory utilization as long as obviously your CPU and memory limits um, are set accordingly so that you're not obviously consuming everything in your, your local system. Uh, it also depends on how much your local system has in terms of resources but you don't necessarily need a virtual layer anymore. Like you don't need virtual box or or um, you don't need like VMware, Visa, like workstation or player or anything. Um, they're nice tools to play with if you want to like do other very creative things. But if you have limited resources, you can just get by with Docker or Docker desktop. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. That's uh, that's something that I'm already uh, using. It was I was just uh, curious about how how you would set up like a local local environment of virtualization using Ubuntu or Linux server. That's what I was curious about. Anyway, I was I'm already using those like the Docker desktop, and then I'm interacting with it with my uh, CLI, like my PowerShell. PowerShell is able to interact with your Docker uh, Docker desktop and do pretty much everything you you want to do with your Docker desktop. So, I mean, that's what I wanted to add. And thank you, guys. Oh, thank you so much. One thing I misunderstood, I actually was under the impression you were using a Mac system, but you mentioned PowerShell, so I immediately, like, jumped to Windows. And um, are you familiar with WSL, like Windows Subsystem for Linux? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, and the reason I bring it up is because I think that's one of the preferred approaches for using virtualization inside of inside of your Windows system. But um, I mean, it will, again, come down to how much resources you have available locally. Yeah, I think I have enough. I think I have like 16 gigs. So, I mean, I guess it's going to be enough for what I'm doing. 
Amazing. Thank you so much for asking the question, Adama, and thanks for answering the question, Marino uh, and Chris. I believe we are, you know, past the time now, and the space has been amazing till now. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining, and let's hear some last remarks if a uh, panel of speakers have. So Mystica would like to go ahead, and if you have any last remarks related to this, you want to add. Yeah, thanks for having me and love what you're doing as a community. I'm super interested in cloud native now, so I'm going to dig, dive, dig deep into it. So, so happy to be like being here. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Mystica. And Marino would like to go next. Yeah, um, there are a lot of great communities. I think the Kube Simplify community is excellent. Um, as a part of your journey. If you're more specific and interested in DevOps, obviously follow Mystica and Chris and follow their journeys into networking as well. And then through them, you'll find more people you can follow and learn learn as well. Um, the last thing I'll say is, I mean, there are so many different ways that you can get hands-on. There's so many free ways you can do so. Um, I highly recommend you check out Katakoda. Sibo Cloud, and even some of the free tiers any of the cloud providers offer you as ways that you can get resources to start testing and playing out with networking technologies. That's all I've got. Awesome. Chris would like to go next. Yeah. First of all, I just wanted to thank you for having me. This is uh, my first Twitter space, so it's uh, good to get one of those under the belt. But, but I agree with... Um, with both Mystica and, and Marina. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of information out there. Um, and I think I speak for all of us, definitely myself, when I say, you know, please reach out if you, if you want any help, uh, or I can at least guide you to the correct person or the correct space. Uh, I try to be as helpful as I can, time permitting. Um, so, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you all kind of enjoy your networking journey. Absolutely. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining in. Thank you so much to the speakers. Do give them a follow, everyone, and check out their profiles, follow their journey. You'll definitely get to learn a lot from these amazing people from the community. And lastly, I really want to thank Avinash for being behind the scenes and, you know, hosting this Twitter space and not letting the Twitter gods, you know, uh, disconnect our space for today. Again, thanks, everyone, for joining and see you in the next one.